Welcome to another Civil Air Patrol SUAS Task Guide class. Today we'll be covering Task 0-5110, Identify Visual Clues and Wreckage Patterns from FPV and Orthomosaic Imagery. Let's get started. Knowing what to look for during a search is essential, and a strong grasp of typical visual clues and wreckage patterns you're likely to encounter will boost probability of detection in your missions. Let's dive into some specific visual clues you'll want to keep your eyes open for. Aircraft are commonly painted with white or light colors and some have unpainted aluminum surfaces. These colors tend to stand out against the ground, plus aluminum will flash in bright sunlight. You may also get flashes from windshields and windows as well. Uh, flashes from any angle deserve further investigation. Sometimes aircraft catch fire when they crash. If conditions are right, the burning airplane may cause forest or grass fires, which can put out smoke signals. Alternatively, survivors of a crash may build a fire to warm themselves or to signal search aircraft. Fire causes high contrast blackened areas. You may have to check many such areas though, since burning debris can fall anywhere along the flight path Plus, campers may be throwing you false clues with a perfectly normal fire pit. If an airplane goes down in the woods, it's going to break branches and possibly trees, but the damage it does will depend on the angle it goes down. Our plane here nosedived in, so it only left a small channel of damage. Our next plane is going in with a greater angle. and we have much more damage. Now, besides seeing broken branches or trees, a big clue that a crash happened recently is foliage color. Notice the light green on the trees. Foliage near the interior of trees and underside of leaves tends to be lighter in color, and this foliage may be visible after a crash. Now, as the crash becomes older, foliage will start to yellow as it dies, finally turning to brown. Here's a great example of discoloration as seen from the air. Once they zoom in, it's clear that quite a bit of damage has been done. This may have been from the initial crash or burning wreckage could have ignited some of the surrounding foliage. Freshly plowed earth has a darker color and different texture than surrounding undisturbed earth. And this is because of a higher moisture content retained by dirt below the surface. When an airplane crashes, it will plow the earth to some degree, leaving a clue about its point of impact that can be seen by an overflight for a day or so. Crop farmlands always display a pattern of some type, especially during the growing season. While it's possible that tall growing cornfields could mask the presence of small aircraft wreckage, the damaged or flattened portions of that cornfield will still stand out as breaks in uniformity. Snow readily shows clues and any discoloration will be very evident. Plowed earth might be seen, fuel may spill or start a fire, fires can blacken the area and may expose the earth below, and certainly the wreckage itself will contrast with the snow. Crashes in water usually sink rapidly and become hidden, but clues may remain for a time. As the aircraft sinks, bubbles will rise, Oil and fuel can sit on the surface and cause discoloration. Some of the debris will float. You may see life rafts, but if they're unmanned, they rapidly drift away. Unfortunately, winds and currents can scatter debris in a matter of hours. So as always, time is of the essence. Survivors that are able-bodied may set up signals for you to see. Uh, the kind of signals you might get will, will be limited to the skills possessed and equipment available to each survivor. They may only be able to spell out help on the ground with sticks and stones. But if they have some extra clothes, they can hang them from a tree, which has been known to save more than one life. Now we're moving up in skill and equipment by lighting flares or fires, tying off sections of trees with fluorescent tagging tape, signaling with lasers, using mirrored surfaces to flash light towards you, or taking it a step further, survivors might get targeted light 
flashing towards you with signal mirrors which can be seen for miles. Treat all tracks you come across as possibly belonging to the survivors. Report all tracks encountered so that ground teams can check them and mark them. Otherwise, they may get lost if many teams come through the area. A variety of scavenger animals may move in towards a crash site, and they can potentially tip you off that you're getting close. SUAS crews and ground teams can prepare themselves to recognize this clue by researching the kinds of scavengers in their state and region. Now, while operating in Arizona or within the southwest region, you may come across turkey vultures, which have a keen sense of smell and the inborn ability to recognize critically injured people or animals. Black vultures, which have no sense of smell, so they tend to follow turkey vultures into crash sites. Coyotes, who are opportunistic omnivores. And you may also see Mexican wolves prowling and black bears moving into the area. Night searches are infrequent, but if you're on one, light will be your only clue. Hopefully survivors have flashlights, or perhaps they've been able to start a fire for warmth and signaling. The light doesn't need to be extremely bright to be visible, and survivors have been rescued after signaling with only the flint sparks from a lighter. Keep in mind that you're bound to get hit with false clues along the way. The smoke signals, blackened areas, or lights at night may have been from regular campers. Oil slicks or other discoloration in water may be from passing ships. Old wreckage on the ground may not be clearly marked, or painted yellow X's have begun to fade and are only evident up close. And be sure to report false clues so that search teams can bypass them from that point on. Understanding how wreckage can appear on the ground will help you recognize signs to be looking for, which boosts probability of detection. The hole in the ground is caused from steep dives into the ground or from flying straight into steep hillsides or canyon walls. Wreckage is confined to a small circular area around a deep, high-walled, narrow crater. The structure may be demolished with parts of the wings and tail near the edge of the crater. A vertical dives into heavily wooded terrain will sometimes cause very little damage to the surrounding foliage. In some cases, only a day or two is needed for the foliage to repair itself. The corkscrew or auger is caused from uncontrolled spins. Wreckage is considerably broken in a small area. There are curved ground scars around a shallow crater. One wing is more heavily damaged and the fuselage is broken in several places with the tail forward in the direction of the spin. In wooded areas, damage to branches and foliage is considerable but confined to a small area. Creaming is often caused from low-level buzzing, scud running, or an attempted crash landing. The wreckage distribution is long and narrow, with heavier components farthest away from the initial point of impact. The tail and wings remain fairly intact and sheared off close to the point of impact. At ground looping sometimes terminates the wreckage pattern with a sharp hook and may reverse the position of some wreckage components. You can see the tail there and the main body somewhat turned. Skipping is also common in open flat terrain. And then check this out, both the main body and tail appear to have experienced ground looping here. In wooded areas, damage to the trees is considerable at the point of impact. But the wreckage travels among the trees beneath the foliage for a greater distance and may not be visible from the air. Hedge trimming is caused when an aircraft strikes a high mountain ridge or obstruction, but continues on for a considerable distance before crashing. Trees or the obstruction are damaged or the ground on the crest is scarred. Some wreckage components may be dislodged, usually landing gear, external fuel tanks, um, cockpit canopy, or control surfaces. And then the direction of flight from the hedge trimming will aid in further search for the main scene. The four winds uh, results from mid-air collisions, explosions, or in-flight breakup. 
Wreckage components are broken up and scattered over a wide area along the flight path. The impact areas are small, but chances of sighting them are increased by the large number of them. A splash is caused when an aircraft has gone down into water, and we've already covered what to look for when an aircraft hits water and sinks. This pilot got lucky and didn't sink, probably due to a shallow area near the lake's edge. Now who knows, this plane may fly again one day. In order to see and recognize visual clues and wreckage patterns from SUAS FPV and Orthomosaic Media, you need to be aware of system capabilities and limitations. While in motion with an SUAS, you'll introduce a corresponding motion blur in your live feed, which can distort the image and make it difficult to search. A better tactic is to fly to an area, stop and look around, then fly to a new area and repeat. Your feed will be much clearer using this method. Purposeful overexposure exploits a feature of the DJI ground control station and uses the overexposure warning to help you pick out targets. Now turned on, it paints overexposed objects in your field of vision with a black and white stripe zebra pattern. And you'll need to play with these settings though and choose your opportunities to use this because we can see here um, with the wrong settings, this overexposure warning is now also triggering for the bare earth terrain in addition to the plane wreckage. You can see that in the bottom left. Um, if using DJI GO 4, you can get to that setting going to camera settings, then the gear, then turn overexposed on. The ability to pick up clues from orthomosaic imagery depends on the resolution of your final map. This map indicates it's at 0.5 centimeters spatial resolution, which means each pixel represents about 0.2 inches of space on the ground. Now at that resolution, it's no wonder you can pick up the numbers off the tank. Let's take a look now at what kind of spatial resolution you can get with the DJI Phantom 4 Pro drone and the free mapping ground control station software, Pix4D Capture. We're inside Pix4D Capture now on an iPad and let's get into settings. Then I'll make sure my Phantom 4 Pro is chosen. Now let's go to grid and make a 2D map. So first you find your target using the global map, then place and expand the flight path box to encompass the target. To the left, you can see we're mapping at 200 foot AGL and expecting a spatial resolution of 1.31 inches per pixel. Then time to complete is estimated at about 17 minutes. Then on the right, we've descended to 150 foot AGL, which has increased our expected spatial resolution to 0.98 inches per pixel, but at the cost of an additional two minutes mapping time for a total sortie time of 19 minutes. So you have potentially spatial resolutions of 1.31 and 0.98 inches per pixel, but what does that mean in context? So let's put some perspective on it. FEMA publishes the preliminary damage assessment guide and in the appendix near the back, they provide guidance on what resolutions they prefer for airborne imagery. And satellite imagery should be at least 20 inches per pixel. So those pixels are big and coarse. And they want high-res airborne imagery shots to be 10 inches per pixel. FEMA says they prefer high-res oblique shots from airborne with 6 inches per pixel. And then with the Phantom 4 Pro and Pix4D, we're getting 0.90 inches per pixel at 150 feet. So you can see by comparison how small your pixels are. And again, smaller pixels mean finer details and better quality. In order to turn your high quality imagery into a map that clues can be picked out of, it's necessary to choose the right settings inside your chosen mapping software. In this instance, we're using Pix4D Mapper on Windows, running good hardware and processing 159 photos of a nearby wash. Now we're pushing this map out quickly to IC, so we've chosen rapid quality, which took 16 minutes and produced a file size of 22 megabytes. This will be a map that gives IC an overview of the area and does enhance their situational awareness, but it lacks fine detail. Let's zoom in here and look closer at the details. And we've noticed something that looks like debris near the center of the photo. Getting closer now, let's take a look at the bottom debris. 
but it's impossible to tell what this is. Now we've switched to high quality and it greatly enhanced fine detail. You can make out what looks like a tire here, possible crushed landing gear. Better send out another sortie to investigate. Now, if you take a look at our stats on the left, processing time has increased to 34 minutes with this high quality and file size has jumped to 250 megabytes. Thanks for coming to class today. If you'd like to see more of these videos in the future, let us know by liking and subscribing. Take care and we'll see you in the next one.